Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is a well-known stuntman and stunt choreographer, as well as many other things. Uh, he has worked on numerous projects, such as the Hobbit trilogy, Ghost in the Shell, Spartacus, and more. Stephen Davis, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I'll admit that this is my first podcast, so... Oh, uh, yes. We, there you go. So forgive me if I ramble and struggle with thoughts. I'm a, you know an experience to this so. no no it's all good well i suppose it's just it's just a natural conversation i guess like always so it's all good um so i i, I suppose the first thing i want to know is in terms of being a stuntman what are like the most important things about being a stuntman safety so yeah yeah well of course of course given recent situations with the whole alec baldwin thing but um Yes. Yeah, it's been a bit of a bit of a tough week in the industry for us, um, and that's that's actually come through and affected the job that I'm currently on. Um, you know, there's there's been quick repercussions around the world um, in regards to armory safety, and and um, and I think even um, I, I'm straight away I'm going straight off topic from the question you first that's, asked. Me. That's that's all right. Um, Let's keep going. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting uh, that this happened right off the heels of a proposed strike from um, American industries in regards to overworking culture in the film industry. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so, but to go back to your question, yeah, absolutely, uh, 100%. Uh, safety is the number one issue that we always look at as a stunt performer. Um, everything has to be done so that we can get up and do it again and not only we can get up and do it again um, that day but we can get up and do it again 10 years from now there must be certain ways you have to land and like when you throw a punch I mean these are probably all basic things for a stuntman right but yeah so, so as you touched on my specialty is I'm a fight guy yeah I work as a fight choreographer. Um, I work in, with uh, actors, training them and getting them prepared for screen. Um, and, yeah, so a stunt person needs to treat themselves very much like they are a professional athlete. So you must stay trained. You must stay in shape. Um, and you, you need to learn how to fall. You need to learn how to throw punches safely um, in regards to the camera, in regards to working with other people. Um, you never want to hit another stunt performer and you sure don't want to hit an actor who's been paid $5 million for a movie because you are packing your bags and you're going home. Um, so, yeah, it is it is a very skill-based um, job and it is a very athletic job. And, and yeah, so we learn, we learn how to fall over properly um, and to be able to fall over continually yeah so what's involved with that can you give me an example so like with the way you fall like say if you're i don't know falling off a car or something and you had to land on your back there'd be a certain way you have to fall right i mean that's probably a lame cliche example but as a as a question but yes so there's there's certain techniques like the first thing you always do when you fall is protect your chin protect your head and your neck so we, we tuck our chins um and it's all about neck control the last thing you ever want to do is when you fall throw your head back you're either going to get whiplash or you're going to smash your head into the ground or the wall um and that's going to you know give you concussions um and worse um so neck control is always the first most paramount lesson you'll learn and then it's about how to um, disperse your weight. Um, sports like judo, uh, a very, very good foundation for learning how to fall over. In judo, you get thrown on the ground a lot, like constantly. And so you learn how to hit the ground and tag the ground before your, the rest of your body hits the ground. And we learn how to disperse the weight evenly. We, of course, um, wear pads wherever we can 
especially if you're doing a car hit, you uh, are, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to go into that without any protection, such as uh, sneaking under costume, elbow pads, hard knees, um, what we call back pads, kidney protectors. Um, yeah, so you try and cover cover up the body. You can almost guarantee that no, wherever you pad up, you've got to hit an area that's not padded. That's uh, that seems <laughs> to be the nature of the game. Um, and uh, and barring that, the the next thing up is um, wherever we can, and this is production budget dependent. Uh, we'll try and soften out the actual set itself, so we can oh. find ways to. Um, a lot of art departments now are fantastic, and special effects departments are fantastic at being able to replicate hardened areas of a set um, in a dense um, foam, and they can paint them up. For example, if I was landing on wood, a wooden floor, like I've got in this hotel room, they can create foam, thick foam layers, and paint them up to look exactly like floorboards. So it just helps take the sting out of a lot of the falls, which makes it more repeatable. Uh, the more repeatable it is without the fear of injury, the better um, the, the better each take is. Right. Yeah. So have you had any injuries on set? Yeah. Yes, I have. Um, thankfully, nothing – well, no, I have had majors. Um, I've had nothing life-threatening. Um, I've had a couple of small broken bones, but I've been very lucky on the broken bone department. I have, however, um, blown out my right knee quite severely um, on a job, which required uh, full reconstruction. And, uh, yeah, that, that one hurt pretty bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, I bet it did. And, and yeah, that took me I, – um, luckily, I was still able to do some choreography work um, while I was out, but it did take me about a year before I was able to return to um, performing at – full speed and uh even now five, i'm five years on for six years on from it and i'm still including rehab to try and get the last two percent of movement out of it you know for for work i include that as part of my daily training routine wow yeah so um but no luckily like i said i, I haven't had anything that's been life potentially life-threatening but yeah, you know, I've done um, – I broke a toe on a job and kept going that day. To, I, I finally got kicked off set by the coordinator who told me to go home and put someone else in my costume. Um, but, that, you know, that's pretty minor stuff. Um, the job, you, you have to understand that if you, want to, if you want to get work as a stunt performer – you are going to have bumps and bruises. You are going to get hurt. Even though we try our best to make stunts as safe as possible, there's never a guaranteed 100% safety. And it's the same as every time we walk across the road. You know, mm. we can look both ways and assume we're going to be good, but then I could trip off the, um, the curb as I take a step forward. So, um, but yeah, um, bumps and bruises um, are part of the game. We try and avoid anything worse than that. I've yeah. heard of um, knees and toes being quite common in terms of people breaking them, in terms of stunt people. Is that the, that, yeah. that would be the most common ones, I suppose. Yeah, and shoulders. Ah, oh, yes, of Sh course. Shoulders as well. So bro broken bones will usually happen from impacts. Um, joints will often be because of an angle of impact. So... Usually we'll blow a knee out because we've we've come into the fall sideways or as opposed to back on, for example. Um, and it will cause like a loading to a joint where you really don't want it to be loaded. Um, often, you know, if you have any sort of fall where you're going head, head over tail, sometimes you can come in hard on the shoulder. That can blow a rotator cuff. Um, and all that stuff is... Um, a long road to recovery to come fully right. And uh, that's what we call bad days at the office. Yeah, I bet. So do you prefer the actual stunt work or do you prefer being a choreographer? Um, I love performing. Um, however, I'm getting older. 
And uh, <laughs> so my prime years, it's really funny because I'm on, I'm on a job at the moment that is an absolutely fantastic job. It's a dream job. Um, and knowing that my best years are actually behind me, um, which is always a bit of a shame. So you sort of feel like, oh, my God, this job might be my last chance to, you know, do, get to yeah. do the pinnacle of what I want to do. Um, but I love choreographing. Absolutely love it. Um, it's where I want to go. Um, it, it's, it's where I love being uh, positioned in the team. Um, we do, I, um, I spend a lot of time behind the camera now um, in regards to shooting what we call stumpers. So when we choreograph for a sequence, what we aim to do is film it and, and present it in such a way that it will almost reflect the final product. And that's not to say that we're, what we try and do is influence a director's decision on how he wants to shoot a sequence. It's an opportunity for us as a stunt department to sell a concept on how we think a sequence could go. So if we have a fight sequence that we've put together and we're, we're like, well, we think it, you know, these moves, blah, 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 into these moves, boom, 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 but they need to pause here because this moves hurt him. So we'll film it like you would a, a standard film or a short film to show those nuances when we present it to the director and the director can take them on board or if he'll ask for changes or, but it allows for a, a representation of the final product. So they can best inform both the director and every other head of the department. Um, and so I'm doing that a lot now and um, I actually love it. You know, so we shoot and we get it and add like the most rudimentary, rudimental, basic um visual effects to it to make it look cool and um yeah it's it's, it's good fun i've seen um, i've seen definitely where I want to go. Yeah. i've seen some of your reels and they do look like really really cool cuz what you film it and you edit it as well right so you're editing all the different yes. angles yeah yes so yeah. cuz you know with hollywood cinema there tends to be quite a lot of quick cuts compared to say asian cinema because obviously the actors are usually doing a lot of the stunt work so as a choreographer, are you trying to choreograph it and do the pre in a way where there's uh, less, less amount of cuts? Yeah, so... Um, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, in some of it, it d- depends on the actor and what they're actually physically capable of doing as well, right? Yeah, 100%. It also depends entirely on the production and the job. So um, sometimes it's just a chance for us to express ourselves as a department um, creatively, um, which is always a nice little outlet. Uh, I've always looked at, at previs as a chance to problem solve before you get into production. So, yeah, sometimes if, if the actor just isn't up to par as far as um, uh, physical ability goes, then, yeah what we'll often have to do is shoot them tighter and edit more. Um, uh, a lot of the quick fire editing that you, you, you touched on also I think occurs from um, maybe a slight lack of confidence in the coverage. And what I mean by that is sometimes you'll get a director that will over shoot something so they may shoot something even if the performers are really really good they may linger on a shot for a a long time on one camera and you might get that coverage that eastern coverage um but if you stick three other cameras on it because you think you're gonna make your day faster the performers might be doing 30 seconds of action but if you've got four cameras on it at the same time what winds up happening uh, a good friend of mine, Brett Chan, uh, likes to put it this way. It's like giving crack to a crack addict when you're handing all that footage over to an editor. Oh, right. Right, so you give an editor 30 long seconds of, of amazing footage from five different cameras. Sometimes, unless they've got a, a guiding hand 
uh, like if the director's not on their shoulder, they may have the feeling or the feel the pressure that they have to use every camera because it's been shot and it's been handed over. So they might feel like they have to use every every shot um, as opposed to the, the A cam, which captured a beautiful long take. Because I think I think now, yes, um, Asian cinema is, has always been king of capturing fight scenes, but the West has also had plenty of amazing examples of long continuous takes. Um, with with amazing actors and performers who have put the time in to to get to that position, so yeah, so that's 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 kind of one one reason why why that happens. Um, again, with when it comes to um, previsiting, um, as I was saying, uh, sometimes I find previsiting previsiting is a good chance to also problem solve before you get to a film set. So I worked on a job called Warrior. Um, with um, the, the aforementioned Brett Chan, mm. who's an amazing fight choreographer and um, um, all around nice guy, and and um, he was second unit director on that job. And so when we would construct previses, we would have certain parameters that we would have to solve. So if we knew that we only had half a day to film a fight scene. Oh, actually, I'll give you an example. So I was tasked with looking after a fight sequence in the middle of a tournament montage. We knew we had a Moby, which is a, just like a ring. It's like a steady cam, but you hold it on a ring and it's, it's got a, um, a cable suspending to take the weight for the operator to use. We had a 360-degree um, area to film in, so we could look anywhere and we could swing the camera around. But because we had a lot of fights to do, we had 90 minutes, so we broke it down to, okay, so this fight can only have nine setups, nine that we can move at such and such a speed. We have good performers. We have 10 minutes per setup, which is moving pretty quick. Um, and so, therefore, when we design the fight and we design the previs, we designed it to know that we wouldn't use more than more than nine shots to get the fight. So that was, that's a form of problem solving. Um, on the same job, we would do stuff like using CG blades um, if someone's getting stabbed, but we would know that the visual effects budget wouldn't allow us to do a long shot with a CG blade doing a lot of fight quarry and then going in for the stab. We would have to use our actual prop blade for all the white shots. And when he goes to the stab, we knew that we would have to cut to a close up of the blade going into wherever it was going in because the VFX budget would only allow for a CG blade for that amount of frames that, you know, like half a second going in. So you, you use the stun biz to try and solve the problems and find creative ways to, to, show the fight in an exciting fashion, but also realize, well, if they've only got half a day to shoot something, there's no point us presenting a previous that's got a hundred shots setups in it. it right. You know, if, you know, if, if it's only going to take them half, you know, if they only have half a day to shoot it, then we can't really give them a fight. That's going to be more than 10, 15 shot setups. And also knowing how quickly such and such a crew on whatever job you're on, how, however long they're working. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And I think also just on one other note, for me personally, there, there's so much involved in choreographing a fight. And it's not just, you know, about punching and, and coming up with cool moves. And sometimes it's about the restraint of cool moves, knowing when a fight should mm. just be, uh, I'm going to walk up to you, I'm going to punch you in the face once and you fall over. <laughs> is that the most appropriate thing for a character? Or are we going to walk up and go, bah, 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 and we have like a 30 beat fight scene and I'm jumping in the air like Trinity and, you know, we're doing a, you know, if it's a Saturday night punch up at a, at a nightclub, it's not, it, you know, it's always about learning your character. And I think half the reason that I love being behind camera now is 
camera is part of the choreography. Camera is a character in itself. And learning where to put the camera and how to move the camera and when to move the camera will accentuate and add to the story that you're trying to tell with the fight sequence, which is why Stumpers has become such an important part of the process in the last, at least uh, in the last 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, it was almost a non-thing. It, it was very rarely done. And now the level of Stumpers is very, very high. Because again, every time that you are trying to demonstrate to a director of the vision of the fight, part of that is well, we we feel that the camera would be here, it would punch in. It's got to it's got to be on this side. It's got to pull out to show this. This is you know this is how the emotion builds on this part of the fight, and so forth and so forth. So for me, getting behind the camera is just as much being inside the action when we're designing it um, as I ever have or was or have have been as a performer. So, yeah, mm. I mean, I, I think that's pretty much yeah. my thing on that subject, yeah. So are you able to watch a movie and totally disconnect from it or are you picking up on all the fight scenes and critiquing it or kind of taking a mental note? in terms of research? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so if it's a really, really good movie, I'll, I'll just watch it and love it, you know. It's when the movie starts to lose me that I'll sit there and start to cr- critique the crap out of it. And I have, I have watched a lot of bad movies in my time. <laughs> um, you don't... You don't do action films and not watch a lot of bad action films. And it's very important to understand why what you're watching is bad. Um, uh, I, nothing frustrates me more than when somebody goes, oh, I didn't like that movie. That movie was stink. Oh, that movie was really dumb. It was, it was, I didn't like that movie. It was bad. That, mo- that was a bad movie. So, but why? Why was that movie bad? Uh, it always annoys me if if someone has a strong opinion on a film, but not strong enough to articulate what it was about that film that didn't didn't hurt them. And 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 being in the film industry, um, it is very important to be able to identify those things that didn't make a film work. Yeah. Um, because you want to avoid those pitfalls. You want to avoid those cliches. Um, but yes, to answer your question, and this, this comes to this is so funny because I'm, um, I mean, I'm such a nerd and I love my Marvel movies and um, I've always been a massive Captain America fan. And so, yes, when, um, when in Endgame, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, but I think everybody on the face of the planet has seen it. Yeah. When he catches Molomir and I was, I was in a, I was in a late night screening on opening night in Cape Town. We had a we had a full row of stunt guys, and you know, and this this is a testament to um, big budget movies. Why 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 the big screen has maybe moved away from dramatic dramas, which we kind of get on streaming. But when you're in a, a big cinema. And you get to see a spectacle like that moment and the whole crowd erupts. Yeah. You know, right. people went nuts on that. You know, I was definitely not watching that from a technical standpoint. I was watching that from a from a fanboy um, perspective. So, you know, yes. So the answer to your question was yes, on all accounts. Um, yeah. Usually when a movie's bad, I will dissect. The lighting's bad, the editing's bad, that, that kick was terrible. <laughs> The script is, te- you know, it, I, yeah, I'll definitely go through. And, and and to be honest, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not biased in, in the slightest. I've worked on so many jobs that I knew were bad while I was working on them and um, um, didn't care because I loved, it, loved working on them, but you knew were going to be bad and then watch them. And, and I'll admit, you know, I, I think at least 90% of everything I've worked on has not been good. 
<laughs> but it's the, um, you know what? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend like oh god, you know. Yeah, I worked on this. Yeah, everybody, go watch this film. It was amazing. No, it's gonna be terrible. But I worked on it and got a paycheck, and I actually loved doing the job at the time. So you know, who cares? <laughs> so how long does it? I mean, when you're working on it, how long does it actually take for you to work out? Like, yeah, this is probably not going to be a good film. Was it like Usually the first from day? the first script read. Oh, really? That early? Yeah, but but sometimes I've um I've been surprised. I've seen um I worked on a film early this year um with uh, it was a net, Netflix film and it was it came on uh, read on the page like a really bad cheesy eighties film. It was a really good, fun film to work on. However, the film was incredibly elevated by the actors that were in it. Who There was one scene, and the main character, she had to, con- she had to keep a door closed. And um, actually, I probably shouldn't really be talking about the scenes because it hasn't been released yet. Um, but anyway, um, she had a very... No, that's fine. Um, she has a very strong objective in, uh, um, to do one thing and the motivation for her to not stand her ground is so high that as an actress, she ran such a gamut, you know, that you would never see in a standard action film. You, you know, you, you're not going to... Um, yeah, and that's not to say there's not amazing actors in action films, but you know of female action stars um, we have the likes of Charlize Theron and, and you know who's amazing you know Oscar winning actress but what stuck, struck me about what I thought was a really bland script was brought to life by a character who wasn't playing stoic like Charlotte, um, Charlize often does in her action roles this was a a piece of fluff on the paper that was elevated by an amazing performance. So I'm at the point now where I'm actually not sure if it's going to be a good film or not. I'm hoping it is, but um, I think the actors have certainly brought it to life. And um, there are instances where that does happen. And um, so, yeah, no, I don't always identify when a film is going to be bad, but you do get a sense then sometimes. And then, and then often you'll, you'll prep st- stuff, um and um and you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about it like one of the biggest disappointments um uh the, the two i think two big disappointments in my career working on one was the hobbit which was an amazing job and everybody i worked with were fantastic but from a stunt perspective we went from a job that we did all real stunts in very much like the team had done on Lord of the Rings to sit in a cinema and see that it was all completely replaced by visual effects. So, so was, was that always the intent though, or did that happen late uh, in production, I suppose? I think there was always an intent to do that, but there was always a difficulty in understanding why it was going on. So, so for example, we had we had one stunt. Um, we had a, um, a stunt performer called Brett Sharon who was doubling for Martin Freeman, um, who was playing Bilbo um, Baggins. He gets tackled off a little cliff and he falls. I think we had a fall of about four meters, five five meters. The, to, to, to Matt, so it was just um, he gets tackled out by another stunt performer. I think it was, I think it was uh, Mark Trotter. Tackles them out. They do a great stunt. They they bail. They kind of chirp and fall down. And, and this leads into him finding the ring and and the whole riddle game with with Gollum. And it and it was believable. You know, you've got people falling, falling this you know four to five meter height. It looks like you'd get injured. It looks like you'd get knocked out. Um, it, it did everything to serve the purpose of the story. It then got taken over by visual effects. 
who made it into like a 50 meter fall down a chasm. And instantly as an audience member, and not just somebody who wanted to see a real stunt, you're left going, well, why did they not kill him? How is he even possibly alive, let alone getting up and walking without any injury? Mm. It just instantly kills any suspension of disbelief. And um, yeah, so, um, and that, that seemed to be a continual thread, these, these gags that we, we shot for real and then were taken over um, by visual effects to enhance. Um, but unfortunately, I, I, and, and you know, this is a personal opinion and, and, and I don't want to take away anybody else's enjoyment of the films. Or, um, but for, for me, I just sort of felt you had more realism in the first original films because whether it was by necessity that they didn't have the VFX capabilities or budget, that they stuck with stuff that was more real. Um, I, but again, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I no. spoke to um, a set designer on the Hobbit films who actually worked on Lord of the Rings, Ra Vincent, and he was mm. talking about shooting on location as opposed to in a studio. And mm. just because of the advancement of technology, it's made things so much cheaper and easier to do it that way. Um, mm. As to whether, I don't know why they do take something like that though, because that seems like more work to take a six meter fall and turn it into a 50 meter fall. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, it, it, I find the whole behind the scenes of the Hobbit very fascinating because everything, it sounds like there were so many problems with the making of that trilogy versus Lord of the Rings because of all the, politics behind the scenes but um because you did stunt work for uh luke evans and uh lee pace as well right okay um yes so uh, it's a funny one because i think i'm credited as doubling lee pace <laughs> yeah um, you are yeah <laughs> um, i i actually didn't that was we had a double um I worked a lot with Lee. I designed this fight action for him. Um, but we had a another, uh, Carl Van Roo was actually his double that we had, had slated. Uh, we never needed to use him, uh, but he was, he had rehearsed, he was ready to go. Um, Lee didn't have much action that required any doubling. So, but we had, we, yes, we had Carl, Carl Van Roo. Um, was actually his double, um, but he didn't actually get any camera time, unfortunately for him, um, because Lee was Lee was good. He was able to. Um, he worked hard. He learned his sword fighting stuff, and that was pretty much the extent of what Lee had to do for the film. Was a, a couple of um, double sworded fight action in the film, uh, but you know, no, I did. I doubled um, Luke Evans. Uh, who was um, who was awesome? Um, and we had a massive sequence. <laughs> Again, a slight disappointment. We we spent two and a half weeks swinging around, doing big, some big stunts, uh, some of the biggest stunts of my career at the time, um, around the rooftops of Lake Town. Um, and for the theatrical version, all the stunts were cut. The entire sequence was cut. Um, you know, which is which is tough. You spend all this time, you go, man, I can't wait to get the footage. This is going to be good for my show reel. Um, I had to, and it was one of the earliest things we shot. It was shot in the first block of filming of, of, of principal shooting of the first movie. And then, you know, it comes out in the third movie, the cut the sequence, and then they brought a little bit of the sequence back. So I was able to get some footage of the stunts. Um, for the director's cut for Blu-ray or, or DVD. Um, so it's like waiting three and a half, nearly four years before from, from filming something to being able to even see any sort of product of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was kind of my involvement in, in that. Um, I, do, um, I do thank the um, stunt coordinators at the time, um, uh, Glenn Boswell and Tim Wong, um, during the pickups, um, I was, they 
gifted me with a with my first fight choreography job. I um, looked after most of the main fights, main um, actor fights for the second film and but mostly the third film. Um, all except um, the legalist fights, which was um, taken care of by another really good stunt performer, um, Alan Smith, at the time. So, um, yeah, so that was my first actual professional choreography job. So I do, I do, um, I do appreciate the job, and the job was great to work on. Um, but again, you know, sometimes you just like, oh my god, I wish my stunts were in the film. We did these stunts, and now we filmed them. And they're just not there, and um, and I, and I guess that's the same as any actor, you know, an actor that goes into a, a film, it's their their chance for a big break, you know. Oh no, my scene's been cut from the movie. No one's going to see it. Oh, damn it! It's just, it, it's just the same thing. Yeah. Well, and I suppose it's you want it on your CV, right? And it's something to show off, as you said, in a show reel. So if you don't have it, it's it's annoying. Considering if you've put in all yeah. this time and effort. Yeah. Um. Yes, it is. But I, as I've gotten older, I've started to realize it is good to have a show reel because I, I, I'm constantly being asked, uh, you know, I'm submitting you for a job. Do you have a reel? Usually, though, um, usually, though, and more at my point now, I'm getting work via recommendations from people I've worked with. I've, uh, and it's usually if you do a good job and you, and you get along well with the people you work with, they'll tend to want to work with you again. And that's usually the best way to get through the industry. Um, but being in stunts, it's a, funny, it's a funny position. You're sitting between being cast or performers and being crew. So if, if there's action films being shot, you'll, you'll often get hired more continually than a performer will. Uh, than an actor will, purely by the fact that you're almost crew. So an action film needs to be crewed by stunt performers. So you you have a little bit more control over your career than an actor who probably would need the credits and the and the and the um and the reels a lot more. Um, again, it's just I think it's it's just nice for your own ego as well. You know your own personal. Satisfaction. Go, yeah, that's it. That's it. Stunts. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to post that, get a bunch of likes, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, just don't ever post anything from behind the scenes, ever. Yes. If, 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 if any, any new stunt performers are out there, never, ever, ever, ever post anything from behind the scenes. And, and my own personal, uh, because, because if it hasn't come out and you're still on the job, you'll get fired. <laughs> That, that's just it's, we all sign NDAs. Don't do it. Yeah. Um, it's not worth the likes. You're not going to get anything out of the likes. The people that are going to like it for you are not the people that are giving you your next job. And that's the reality check. Getting getting 300 likes on uh, behind the scenes that spoils something in a movie is not going to get you your next job. It'll probably do the opposite. The people you need to impress are the people that you work with, and. And they don't need to see behind the scenes stuff because they were there. Is that quite common though? Surely people wouldn't do that, would they? That just seems like such a stupid thing to do. Yeah, you would think so. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Um, the guys I'm working with right now, they're talking about people back home uh, posting stuff on jobs that they're on. Oh. And, and it's crazy. Um, and, and even, uh, and it's, it's not so much a. The, people will post behind the scenes stuff um, after a film has come out. Um, but I'm not even a fan of that. I might post something. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not beyond trying to raise my profile and get more job. I'm terrible at it. Um, I'm, I, my narcissistic streak just isn't quite... <laughs> is that large that I'm posting every day. I'm lucky to post something a month. Um, but I might post something from something I've worked on if I was proud of it. But even after it comes out, I, 
I I will very, 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 very rarely post anything from behind the scenes. And it's usually only something I would have posted that was posted by that production first. So if they've done a behind the scenes documentary, then I'll share that. But if it's personal footage that I got from behind the scenes, it doesn't matter if it's out already, uh, if, if the production is, has been aired. Um, it's still something I don't share. And, it, and for me, and this might be just me being old, um, but I, I still think of films as a bit of a magic trick. We don't wow. need to show everybody how we did the magic trick. Well, I can uh, take you yeah, out of yeah. the the uh, the magic of it, pretty much. Yeah, you lose the like, immersion if if you're trying to figure out how it works. I mean, that's happened to me a couple of times where I'm watching a film and I'll be like, I know how they did that, you know, because I've watched some behind the scenes footage. Yeah, yeah. There's a great again. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin the magic trick. Um, yeah, there, there's been there was one film in a couple a couple of years ago where they did a gag. And the hit was so hard that my first reaction when watching it was just like, oh, God, oh, man, that stunt, dude, that stunt guy is wrecked. Oh, God. <laughs> and then it wasn't until I didn't even think about it. Even, even probably, This was a good example of me being so gross in the film. I was just reacting to what was going on. I wasn't trying to dissect how it was done. It wasn't until later that it was pointed out to me, and then when I really looked at it, and stuff they switch out they do the, they they cut to a different angle on the throw and it's a dummy taking the hit for like 10 frames of of um of footage and um but it works so well but it's a classic it's a classic magic trick you know you get to set up with the real person and then hit with the dummy and then you're back to the real person and um but if you're always, if you know how everything's done, yeah, I think it does spoil the magic again. And which comes back to your question of when you work in the film industry, you are aware of these magic tricks and can you turn your brain off? If every, every audience member knows how everything's done, they're going to be analyzing it as well from, from a non-enjoyment standpoint. Have you ever worked with an actor who's been like, punch me for real like I've, I've i heard of a story of like on on the dark night where heath ledger asked christian bale to actually punch him in a specific scene um but have you had any scenes like that where the actors just you know they're on their daniel day lewis buzz and they're just like yep let's get all method actor here and do it for real i've, I've worked with some method actors but they they've never intentionally wanted um to be hit um, there's certainly actors who want you to be rough with them. They don't want you to be. They don't want you to be um, gentle. And but that's usually more if you're if you're wrestling with them or you've got to restrain them or something like that. Mm. They they want to be able to fight against it. They don't want to pretend to fight against it. Um, but no, I've certainly never had an actor want to be punched. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that definitely sounds like something I would ask an actor to do to me, though, or another stunt performer. Um, I like, and this sounds very weird, I like being hit in the body for body shots. Please don't hit me in the face, because <laughs> that sucks. Um, and I have had a couple of, of chops, actually. Um, a Hobbit one, I managed, I was grappling a sword, and I had a green screen glove on. And so I couldn't hold the sword properly when I pulled it and it slipped straight out of my hand and smashed me straight in the face. Um, and the actor at the time was so, um, felt so bad about it. He um, um, got me like a, a dinner voucher and, 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 you know, got me a gift and stuff. And it was, it was like, oh, dude, I hit myself in the <laughs> face. It wasn't even you. Um, but no, um, yeah, and for body shots, like I, I like, getting hit because there's a, there's a realism to it. But again, I know how to control, control the flow of that. Um, I know how to control the impact of that, um, but certainly not to the face. And we would never, ever advocate 
if an actor ever wanted that, we would do our we would do everything we could to talk them out of it. Yeah. Um, but yes, I have heard stories of of method actors who you know, you know, want to get hit in the hands or you know they want to feel of something to the body, but that you know from a pure the the show must go on. Production has to continue. Standpoint: You can't have somebody being hit in the face, or anything that's going to cause any injury or destroy continuity for earlier scenes that have yet to be shot. For example, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's probably a good answer. I'm glad that you actually haven't done it or been asked oh, no. to do it. Yeah, no. Well, not yet. Hopefully, I haven't jinxed no. you. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you stay in shape? And like, what's your diet like? My Has diet it been is the... terrible. I've what? been, I've been, I've been, I've been snacking on these. It's actually a cheat day today. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I switched. Oh God, um, I went to vegetarian a couple of years ago. Um, other than that, I really have no discipline. When it comes to my diet, I do have discipline um, in my training. I'm very habitual. I'm on six day training weeks as well as uh, um, very, very physical hours at work. So at the moment, I'm on five day working weeks, but I will still get in 90 minutes to two hours of training in the evening. Wow. Um, to the point where I kind of need to eat crap. Um, like I, I, I eat a lot of carbs just to try and maintain calories at the moment. I'm, I'm actually losing a little bit of weight on this job. Um, so it's more, it's less for me, it's less diet. I, I certainly try to eat healthy, but I don't stick to any specific diet. And if I'm craving some peanut M&Ms, I'm going to snack on them. Um, I don't, I work, I feel like, yeah, my, and, and, and for me, it's not a chore either. I actually love, I love working out of, of it's, it is habitual. I feel, I feel like I have to have to work out even after, after work. It's just part of my routine. It, it is very habitual. It's not, um, it's not a chore it's not labor it's something i enjoy doing um what i don't enjoy doing is dieting so i just yeah it's i have to be fit for my job and then the diet just kind of i eat what i need to eat to train to be good at my job so if you're a vegetarian so where do you get your main source of protein from <laughs> protein powders and protein bars <laughs> that's mostly it. yeah yep yep um yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, I just it. try and make it as simple as possible. I can't cook for crap. And, um, <laughs> well, you probably don't have time uh, either, right? No, I've got this. Um, I keep joking to the wife. I've got. Um, um, I mean, vegetarian right now. It's. I mean, it might not be the healthiest uh, uh, food, but you can get like amazing meat replacement burgers and uh, patties and stuff you know like yeah, beyond yeah. products and possible products and stuff it's so good to the point where i'm not i've never craved not eating meat i mean i love meat but i haven't i haven't felt like oh god you know this is killing me you know, i miss it so much because i've got great replacements the only issue is when you, in, in some countries are harder than others, you go and say, oh, I can't find a restaurant that does vegetarian dishes. Well, there's one vegetarian dish and it's like loaded with all the particular vegetables I really don't like. You know, I find New Zealand's like that a bit. Oh, I think um, uh, New Zealand is, is very, very good in comparison to, um, I did a job in China after I just turned vegetarian and absolutely no restaurant would do it i'd have to um i would have to go to a like ramen pick and select so you actually go through and you pick your yeah, yeah. Your stuff out and put them in that was the only place i could get vegetarian nowhere else would do it you would literally i'd or i'd go to a korean barbecue place and just order oh there's the potatoes there i'll order the potatoes the lettuce the rice that's it nothing out every other pre-made dish 
had meat in it. So you would you would specifically have to. That that was hard. That was hard being there. Um, <sighs> There's a picture yeah. I saw of you from uh, the 2014 um, Industrial Athletic Hawks Bay Open. I think it was. Oh, yeah. Well, you're I'm shredded. You're fully shredded. I was yeah. like, damn, when I saw that, I was like, man. I was like, your training must have been so intense for that. Well, it was then. And that, and that was a little bit earlier on too. So two things contributed to that. A, I was super into CrossFit, but I wasn't working as regularly. So I was training and I was competing in, in local CrossFit events to tide me over between jobs. That was, that was the thing that was keeping my mind active and interested um, when I wasn't working. And that was taken just before I, I went and did a job straight after that, which I actually had to um, soften out for. I was doubling an actor. Um, uh, again, I was hired by Tim Wong and, and Glenn Boswell. And, um, Tim, had told me, Tim had told me, you know, he wanted me to double the lead actor in this job. And he's like, oh, no, he's... Um, He's in good shape. You're going to have to lose weight, though. You're going to have to get smaller. So this is this is an important lesson on choosing words correctly. So I assumed he meant that oh, I would lose weight, so I shredded up even more. Like I got <laughs> really um, um, really cut, and I turned up, and he's smaller than me. And then I re- that's when we had the discussion. It was like, oh, you meant. <laughs> I need to stop lifting weights. I need to lose muscle size. When you tell me to get smaller, I think you, yeah. you know, I need to lose that. So then it became pretty much a, a job of um, um, eating donuts. <laughs> so <laughs> what he meant to say was I need to soften out a little bit. Cause, and, 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 and here's the thing about film. If I want to look big on film, I don't go big on weights. What I do is I, uh, you have to strip down body fat because if you look ripped on film, you look massive on film. So you think of like um, um, Brad Pitt and Troy. So he wasn't big, but he was shredded. So he looked, you know, he looked jacked. And so, the, so it's easier for me to lose a couple of kgs of body weight than to try and put a few inches on the arm. But the definition is what's going to make me look big on film because we're always framed to look big. Yeah. You know, if, if I'm in a wide shot, I'm going to look smaller. If, if I'm up close to the frame, I'm going to look bigger. So it's about how much am I defined. Um, but yeah, so that was, yeah. Uh, so, so thank you for the compliments on that photo. That's all right. Uh, That's all right. I was just uh, wondering yeah. what your prep was. To get that, yeah, training. no, I was I was just training really hard. But then the funny thing was, after that job, so I'd softened out a little bit, and then after that job was when I blew my knee out. So then the training, you no, know, I was I was struggling for any sort of maintenance for a year because I was in full rehab for the knee. So that photo is probably the absolute pinnacle of of where I was physically, and um, <laughs> I've been ch- chasing chasing that that perfect photo ever since. Well, yeah. uh, um, and I got to say, it was good downlighting at the time. Yeah, well, it was good downlighting at the time, and I was right in the middle of double unders. You're always going to look good at that very specific moment in time. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, how did you end up linking up with Hits International? How did that all come about? Okay, so um, again, uh, Tim Wong and, and another very good friend of mine, um, Orky Davis, were both members of Hits International. And um, we, I was choreographing for Augie on a show called Shannara um, Chronicles. We were doing the second season. Um, and, yeah, it was my first kind of choreography job for Augie. Um, he had me on as an, as an assistant coordinator as well. And we were talking, he, he was talking about it and he sort of said, that he thought I would be a good fit for their organization. And he, he felt that he would nominate me, but he kind of wanted to do another job with me so that I would develop and, and get better. And then I mentioned it to Tim. And, and Tim was like, 
no, screw that. I'll nominate you right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah. So they just nominated me for it. I, I um, I talked with uh, Brett Chan, who I mentioned earlier for On Warrior, and he um, I had met Brett very, very briefly years and years before he had come out to New Zealand for a, to help on a job, but I'd only met him like very briefly. But we talked, and and we have the same sensibilities, and um. He's about building a, a, an international crew of guys that um, just have a love and a passion for the job. Um, mm. This is the, you know, the film industry, believe it or not, it does have some egos and stuff in it. I know shock horror. Um, it's believable. And so, yeah, and he, he just wanted to build a, a network of, of international um, coordinators and choreographers and, and the like um, that – were just people that loved doing the job and were there to do the job. And um, so I applied and I talked to him about it and where I was and how I felt. And unfortunately, the thing about being in the film industry on a, on a, in a small country in the bottom of the Pacific is it, it is it is difficult to move up the rung of ladders. Um, and this is an, it was a chance for me to broaden my horizons, to gain more experience. Um, it, it's, it's almost like, and, and I touched on this earlier, being a stunt performer is being a professional athlete. Like all athletes, once you, once you hit your ceiling or, you know, you've aged out of the sport, you can really only go on to being management or a coach. But there's mm. only so many coaching and managerial positions for the amount of performance. So, and, and that, and that's, compounded quite heavily in a, in a place like New Zealand because we are small and we are isolated. So we already have like, you know, the coaches and management in their positions. So in, until, you know, either a lot more work comes in that they can't deal with it or it's always difficult to move up and gain that experience. And that's absolutely no fault of, of them at all. That is just the, the, the nature of the business. And, and no matter where you go, that's always going to be the case. There's always going to be more performers. There's going to be less position for the coaching positions, right? So, um, so yeah, I wanted to apply to HITS. And, I, and as soon as I did, um, Brett put me on to a, a job in India um, almost straight away. Um, I then jumped straight from that to his job, Warrior. Um, the two seasons of that with him. Um, and again, um, I've worked a lot with Tim Wong, who's been so fundamental in my career over the years. Um, you know, he's always, he's always believed in me. He's always supported me. Um, and Augie Davis, um, again, who, who's always a pleasure to work with and always gives me the ball and lets me run with it. So they're, they're, they're the three main guys that I, I really owe my current career to. Um, and since joining HITS, I've done a lot of work internationally. Um, and, yeah, I've literally only been home for one job in the last five years in New Zealand. So Wow. Um, due, due to that. Um, and that was Cowboy Bebop um, last year, which is about to drop on Netflix, November 19. There's the plug for that one. Nice. Um, Perfect Which timing. is looking fun. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I got to be a co-fight choreographer under um, uh, um, Alan Popperton, um stunt coordinator on that job, who was, um, yeah, awesome enough to bring me on to the job and, and um, trusted me to help him design all the fight action for it. Mm. Yeah. So I suppose as a result of being part of Hits International, you don't ever have to worry about periods between jobs where you don't have work. Because I hear stories of, you know, there's certain stuntmen or actors and they finish a job and they're like, oh, crap, what do I do now while they're waiting for the next job sort of thing? Okay, so last year, for obvious international reasons, um, you know, it was a bit of a slow year with COVID. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, however, it, it didn't hit me too bad. I, it, it was almost like I got to have two months off during those lockdowns and then we were able to get Cowboy Bebop back up and running for the second half of the year. Oh, in the second half of the year. So 
but last year was still pretty slow. Um, no, I um, before Hits International, I was literally finishing a job and then it was kind of like six months on, four months off, six months on, or maybe four months on, and then five months off. And you'd have to try and survive in that time. And it was, I, since I've joined Hits, bar the COVID shutdown, I've luckily been able to have a new job booked before the end of whatever job that I've been on. And that has done incredible things for my state of mind. And I, I'm i still at a point where I'm a small fish in a big pond on the international stage. And I'm grateful for every opportunity that I get. I'm still... It, it, there's always a grass is greener feeling in this job, especially in New Zealand where I think we're like the second lowest paid English speaking country in the film industry. It doesn't surprise me. Um, and so like I'm working with a, a, an American team right now who's, you know, they're all on SAG rates and it's, it's a, and it blows their mind. Like, you know, I've worked on a, a few films that have grossed a billion dollars and it blows their minds that I'm not on residuals. And they, these guys are all doing Marvel movies. And it's, yeah, you know, it, it goes, oh, my God, you know, these guys are making so much more money and we're doing the same job. At the same time, I am so lucky I'm here in Prague right now working on an amazing job. And I know 95% of my compatriots back home in New Zealand are currently not working. There is nothing filming in New Zealand and they are stuck without employment. I know uh, there's lockdowns going on right now. Um, I mean, I can't get back into New Zealand right now. The, um, the border control quarantine thing is so difficult. And I'm not only not only vaccinated with fully vaccinated, I'm getting an additional vaccination just so I can get additional paperwork. And yet that won't help me get back in the country to go home and see my wife. And um, so, uh, no, I am eternally grateful. It has been very, very good for me. And I understand, yeah, so many, so many people back home will be hurting at the moment because they just, there, there is no work right now. And yes, it is, it can be difficult. Um, so, so yes, his international has been very, very instrumental in allowing me to get more contacts and more work. Yeah. Mm. Well, Hey, I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for taking the time and doing this. Uh, no, thank you very much for listening schedule. to my rambling. No, no, this has been very interesting. Very interesting getting the, the know-how and all this stuff, as well as how you became so shredded. Um, it was great as it's well. A, it's, I, so, uh, I'll be finishing these off, yeah. <laughs> so if anyone wants to see any of your work or keep up to date with what you're doing, even though you're not uh, an avid social media user, what's the best place for them to do that? Oh, that's a good question. I can't even remember what the hell my um, Instagram tag is. I think it's Stephen underscore... A underscore Davis on Instagram. You should be able to find it from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll I'll find the links and post them in the description and everything as well. But um, yeah, cool. Um, otherwise, yes, we've got um, I can't really talk about the job I'm on at the moment. Um, but um, Cowboy Bebop drops on November 19. Um, we also did a film called Interceptor for. Um, Netflix starring Alison Pataki um, early this year. Uh, um, early this year, that should be dropping early next year for Netflix as well. And I'm current, my current job is another Netflix job, so three Netflix jobs in a row. So You're killing it. Good, good on Netflix. And I'll tell you what, streaming has certainly helped our industry as far as the amount of production that are getting made worldwide. So that's why it's well, handy. Uh, I hope this is still just the beginning and you're, you will have your meteoric rise, you know? Uh, You'll me be that me too. Guy. I'm definitely looking more to um, getting behind the camera and, and 
being behind the fight sequences is far, is less than being in front of the camera. But if my body can still let me perform for another 10 years, I'll be very, very happy. Well, you're a jack of all trades and a master of one. So it's good to have both, right? So I think you'll be sweet. Even if you don't have one thing to fall on, you've got others. So you'll be fine, I'm sure. Thank sweet. you very much. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, that's yeah. the... That's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Um, support Cowboy Bebop when it comes out and uh, in all of Stephen's future endeavours. But, uh, yeah, everyone, take care. See you later. Bye-bye.